Hello and welcome to the Tobago House of Assemblies Division of Education, Innovation and Energy's e-learning program. My name is Kimmery Richardson Thomas and today we're going to be exploring Cape Communication Studies. We're going to look at Module 1 which looks at gathering and processing information. We want to be able to understand the processes of active listening and applying these to selected situations. So we're going to take a look at what are some reasons that we can use for listening. Why do we listen? We listen first of all, and it's in, it's in, in no order of priority, but we listen to obtain information. When we look at the news, and even with the situation that the whole world is facing right now, many of us tune into weekly press briefings because we want information. And we listen attentively so that we would know what to do. We listen attentively so that we would know how to operate in the situation that we found ourselves in. So we listen for information. We also listen to empathize. These are very trying times. And many of us may be aware of persons and friends who may have lost loved ones. And when they speak to us, they're speaking to us not necessarily for advice or for us to tell them what to do, but they're, they're speaking to us so that when we listen, we can empathize and say, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. We listen so that we can put ourselves in other person's shoes because people need to know that we understand. We also listen for enjoyment. When we listen to music, it's because we like music and we listen to the particular style or genre that we enjoy. We listen to a play. We listen to spoken word. We listen to movies, but we also incorporate that with our visual sense. So we look at it and listen. But we listen for enjoyment. We listen to stories being read. I'm hoping that for those of you even listening today that this might fall under enjoyment. Let's hope. But we listen for this purpose. A fourth reason for listening is to evaluate. We evaluate an argument. We evaluate a decision. We evaluate a proposal. We break it down to see, does this make sense? Am I understanding this? Has it been presented logically and clearly enough that I can integrate my information to what is being presented to me. When we are engaged in listening, and I want to say to you as students, when you listen to a lecture, you're listening to um, a teacher teaching, and even more specifically, your module one exam has a listening comprehension component. It requires you to really develop your listening skills. And there are certain things that you need to be, be doing in order to enhance proper listening. When you're listening, you need to be able to make proper notes, summarize your ideas, and identify tone and context. We're going to look at this in a little more detail. Welcome to our lesson. Please listen carefully and make notes. First one, before you listen, don't note everything down. And to save space and time, use abbreviations when you can. And a quick and clear way to show relationships is to use symbols. For example... Whoa there! Not easy, is it? Taking notes while listening is challenging. So, first off, here are three ways to help you listen more effectively. Number one. Don't worry if you don't get every word. Just try to focus on the main points. Number two, if you miss a bit, don't keep thinking about it. You'll miss even more if you do that. Number three, if it's a video or audio file, pause and replay important or difficult bits. Now, 10 top tips for taking better notes while listening. First one, before you listen, 
gather information, read relevant course materials, anticipate what's going to appear. You can research keywords and phrases in advance, so you're not surprised when you hear them. Another tip, don't note everything down. Take shortened notes. Think about what's useful and what you can leave out. And to save space and time, use abbreviations when you can. And a quick and clear way to show relationships is to use symbols. For example, equal to, therefore, and arrows, lots of arrows. In fact, if you really love arrows, you might prefer a mind map or a flowchart to show how things connect. Or you might prefer to write simple lines of notes. But don't forget, you can use capital letters, underlining, colors, and shapes to help information stand out. Choose the style that works best for you. Whew, by now you're probably taking a lot of notes, but this is important. Leave some white space so you can add thoughts and clarify things later. And while you're listening, a warning. How will you know if you're noting down a fact or an opinion? If the speaker is just giving an opinion or if the speaker is quoting someone else, make this clear in your notes. Is there a handout for the lecture? If so, you can use this as a basis for your own notes, adding your own thoughts, rather than copying it out. And once you've finished, remember to reread your notes to help the information stick. And rewrite your notes soon after taking them to help them stay in the memory. There we are, 10 top tips. Now, try watching this whole video again, and this time, take your own notes. Good luck. So what is important coming out of that video is that you need to be able to determine what is the method that works best for you. Because each student would have a different style and a different method that works best to help them to retain information. But the key thing is you need to make notes. Summarizing ideas. Summary writing is very important when we look at making notes at understanding and comprehending. And as I indicated earlier, summary writing would have been a skill that you would have, that you would have learned in your CSEC examination and in preparation for your fifth form CSEC examination. A summary is a shortened version of a text. And we're recapping what a summary is. It contains the main points in the text and is written in your own words. It is a mixture of reducing a long text to a short text and selecting relevant information. A good summary shows that you have understood the text. Now let's pay attention here. A summary is a shortened version of your actual text. Whatever the length of the original text is, your summary has to be shorter than that. If the original text is 10 words and you're asked to summarize it, it has to be considerably shorter than 10 words. Additionally, the summary contains the main points. It contains the main points. So you're going to be asked to pull out what are the main points or the main ideas. And more so, it has to be written in your own words. When we look at summary writing, and we're going to explore this next in more detail next week 
when you are identifying main points, there are certain signals that help you to identify what the main point is or what the main idea is. So the summary requires you to sh do a shortened version of the main points in your own words. This is what it means when it says it's reducing a longer text to a short text and selecting the relevant information. Relevant information is key here because again, not all of the information that's in the original text would be required for your summary. A good summary shows that you've understood text and summary writing is a very good way of testing understanding. For our CAPE communication studies, again, because you're going to be doing a listening comprehension exercise, this is a very good, these five points are very handy points to help you to understand how to engage in listening effectively by summarizing. When that passage is being read to you, you need to be able to listen to the passage carefully twice from beginning to end. The person presenting the passage will read it to you twice. But in order to prepare yourselves for something like that, begin to listen to text. Begin to listen to audio recordings and listen twice from beginning to end. Remember your purpose. Why are you listening to this? Because if you've not identified your reason for listening, you may not find yourselves listening effectively. Third, Select the relevant information. Again, you're looking for your key points, your main ideas. And how do you extract that from the original text or piece that you're listening to? Note all the points which should come into your answer and do this very carefully and be sure not to miss anything. I said to you earlier that sometimes you're asked questions and you may take the first part of the question and forget to go back and look at the rest of it. Be sure that you are carefully picking out everything that you're being asked to do and be sure not to mix anything. And number five, you want to be able to make notes. So let's take a look at a simple example of how you can do a summary. Our source, our original text says, the amphibia, which is the animal class to which our frogs and toads belong, were the first animals to crawl from the sea and inhabit the earth. This is our source information. If we're going to summarize this, what it is we want to be able to do is identify the main idea. Who or what is this piece talking about? And a careful observation of the source information tells us that this is talking about the amphibia. The main idea is the amphibia what is being said about the amphibia what is being said is that they were the first animals to crawl from the sea and inhabit the earth so that the main idea the amphibia were the first animals to crawl from the sea and inhabit the earth therefore we're going to find that this information is additional information or supporting details. Specifically, this forms what we call an example. This is an example of types of amphibia. It is not going to be relevant in our completed summary. I like to cross out irrelevant information when I'm doing summary, so that when I cross it out, I've gotten rid of what I don't need so that what remains helps me to structure my summary using my own words. So if we take a look here now, the phrase, which is the animal class to which our frogs and toads belong, is an example. It's not the main point. So it can be deleted. The rest of the text is rewritten in your own words. When you have eliminated the unnecessary information, what remains, you can now begin to use to put it into your own words. And we have the example. The first animals to leave the sea and live on dry land were the amphibia. And we have a shorter version of our original text. Then we talk about identifying tone, 
in particular we are talking about identifying tone and context tone is the expression of the author's or the speaker's attitude toward the subject or towards the audience more specifically tone is the method or technique by which the author creates attitude and i want to take a minute and look at this word here it's mentioned here attitude I like this word a lot. I find that it's a very Caribbean word because when we speak of attitude, it's something that we all know. We know when someone is giving attitude. And this is key for us to understand tone. What is it in the speaker's voice that tells us how the speaker feels? And that is what tone is. We pay attention to these elements. Diction, imagery, figurative language, and syntax. These help us to determine the speaker's attitude, how the speaker feels. Our diction here talks about the, the style of enunciation, how they're pronouncing the words. When we talk about imagery and figurative language, it's those additional details that the writer or the speaker may include in what they say that gives us a key or some type of guide as to how they are feeling. Syntax really has to do with the grammatical structure. How does the speaker organize his or her words? The order in which they've placed the words. And these are very important elements to help us to understand how authors or speakers feel about what is going on at that particular point in time. So let's take a look at the following. Is that your car? Just let me go back a little bit. We're going to take a look at that video that's coming up here next. But what I want you to pay attention to is not just what is being said. I want you to listen carefully to how it's being said. In the video that's coming up, you're going to hear one phrase repeated. Is this your car? And I want you to listen to how they're saying it, but also watch their facial expressions. And you're going to see variations in tone. Pay attention. Is that your car? Is that your car? Hey, is that your car, mate? Is that your car? Whoa, is that your car? Is that your car? Is that your car? Is that your car? Now, we looked at that video, and in each instance, we heard a different type of pronunciation. We saw different expressions. If we take back at when the police officer asks, is that your car? Usually in that type of context, the tone is one of what? It's a type of accusation, because you're wondering, did you steal that car? We saw the little boy who got very excited. Is that your car? because he's very excited. He couldn't believe it's just yours. And the tone was one of excitement and appreciation. But in every single example, it was the same word. When we talk about tone, I want you to remember that you know what this is. Do not take tone as a purely academic concept. You know tone. You often use it verbally and you can identify it when you hear it. You know when someone is giving you attitude. You know tone. The same words may reveal quite different attitudes depending on their context. And as such, the listener must remain mindful of the situation surrounding the speaker. So let's look at this. Imagine that you are studying for your communication studies examination. Think of what your verbal tone would be if you apply these six simple words. I'll be there in a minute to the following situations. For example, I'll be there in a minute. But your mother calls you for the fourth time to take out the garbage. What do you think your tone might be? At that point in time, you may find that, oh gosh, mommy. But because there is still respect for your mother, you're not going to answer, I come in just now, I'll be there in a minute. You may sound a little frustrated and you may hear, I'll be there in a minute. 
so that the tone here may be a frustrated tone. It may even be exasperated. Because you're concentrating on your exam, but you're responding to someone you respect. How would it change if the situation is your baby brother who's asked you for the fifth time to help him with his homework? It's no longer mommy, but your brother. I'll be there in a minute. He's been calling and calling. How would you respond? Oh, oh gosh, I'll be there in a minute. Maybe if you're not very patient. So you may find that you may answer your baby brother in a, a tone that's a little harsher, maybe. So it might be an irritated tone. Going back. It might be a tone of irritation. So you're irritated. And depending on how much you've been studying, you may be even a bit angry. But how can that change if we have a situation where your girlfriend or boyfriend calls you on the phone and asks you to come over because he or she has made some cookies for you as a motivation to study? What kind of tone would it be there? I'll be there in a minute. Maybe. Depending again on where you are in the studies and how, if, if you didn't fall out with your girlfriend or your boyfriend, you may find that the tone here at this point may be more agreeable. It might be more agreeable, it might even be playful. But you have to still be studying the work, not playing when you're studying. It may be agreeable, it may be playful, it may even be enthusiastic. It may be enthusiastic. Right. Mm -hmm. In each of our examples, the tone would vary. We do, when you hear people talking about using a monotone, it means that you've maintained one tone even where a situation may require you to adjust your tone. And it's important for us to be able to understand how to pick up these different cues and keys to help us to determine exactly what is the writer or speaker's tone given a particular context. Sometimes we find there are certain things that may affect our ability to listen carefully. And these are some examples of barriers to effective listening. If you have hearing problems, you're experiencing hearing loss, undoubtedly it would affect your ability to listen. If you've lost interest, and I hope that this is not a case going on with any of my students today. If you've lost interest, you're not going to listen. You might find that the speaker is boring or you're doing something else. You've lost interest, no listening. Information overload. You've been reading too much or listening too much. Your mind is tired. That makes it difficult even if you want to. It makes it difficult to listen effectively. The listener's attitude. If your attitude is one of a lack of interest, you really didn't want to be here in the first place, you were being forced to, to sit and listen, it's going to affect how much you're able to actually take in. Cultural differences is a key barrier to effective listening. Because sometimes what one person might deem within a particular culture to be a show of respect, someone else may see that as disrespectful. And it can affect how well you're able to listen to the individual. Wrong assumptions. You thought someone said something about you. It may turn out that it was not true, but when you're, they're speaking to you, you have already shut down. So you've made, you have wrong assumptions about the individual or about a situation, and it impedes your ability to listen effectively. And then there are poor listening skills. Sometimes you find that you're listening, but you're really concentrating on how to respond. 
So you're not paying attention to what is actually being said because you are trying to construct your response. And that is an example of poor listening skills. We want to be encouraged to make sure that we are applying all of the key elements for effective listening, especially as you prepare for your exams. Our final objective today is to look at the process of reading. Specifically, we want to also discuss three different types of reading. The reading process is a three-part process. The reading process will look at what you do before you read, what happens during reading, and also what you should be doing after reading. Before you read, it's a very good idea to preview your material. Good, re good readers, excellent readers, when they get a new text, a new book, one of the things they do is to, apart from looking at the name of the text, they go to the back so that they can see if there's a summary about what this is about or some information about the writer. When you are preparing to read, it's also a good idea to plan. Plan to read. You're not going to pick up a book to read as you're going to feed the dog. You're not going to pick up a book to read as you're going to take a shower. You want to be able to plan to read when you have time to read. And that is effective planning before reading. And you need to also set a purpose. Why are you reading? What is the purpose of this reading? Because that is also going to impact on what you plan to do, what you're going to take with you, and why you're going to actually be engaged in this exercise before you actually start. Our second process is during reading. You need to read with a purpose. Apart from setting the purpose before, when you actually start to read, you need to have a purpose for reading and make connections as you read. When you're reading new information, you should be able to connect it with prior knowledge. And this is a very important process for strong readers, connecting what you're in interacting with now with what you learned before. And the third and final step of our reading process is what you do after reading. You want to make sure that you remember what was read. If you've read something and you forgot it, then it would have been as if you didn't read it at all. So if you're finding it difficult to remember what you read, you need to go back to the beginning of your process and prepare, make notes as you go along. When you're finished with your reading, pause and reflect. What did this information mean to you? What impact do you think it might have on you? Reflect on the reading. And last but not least, sometimes it's a very good idea to reread the information so that you're able to carefully integrate the new content that you would have been exposed to. So we have different reasons for reading. And three main types of reading would be our quick reference reading, critical, or aesthetic reading. Quick reference reading and many of you as students, and once you're in an academic environment, you need to know how to do quick reference reading because this is used to locate general information on a topic. And it requires skimming through lots of reading material. It involves the ability to identify main ideas in selected text and requires the ability to look for signal words. Now let's go over what it is I just underlined. We spoke earlier about summarizing skills, and this is one of the areas that summary writing skills would come in handy for. When you're doing quick reference reading, you're flipping through. You're not able to read every single thing because you're trying to gather as much information in as short a time as possible. You want the general information on the topic. Skimming through is just to read introductory lines, probably what you're reading the first line in every paragraph and maybe the last line, so that you're able to have an idea of what the paragraph was about and determine if it contains the information you're looking for. You want to identify the main idea and what helps you to do that is to look out for signal words. Signal words, simply put, 
would refer to our transition words or conjunctions. These words help guide you in terms of telling you what it is the author is doing. What is the author saying? Let's look at a few examples. When we see the word and or in addition, it really tells us that the author is adding some information to the same idea. The author has not changed the idea that he or she is speaking about, but they're adding information to that idea. On the other hand, says that the author is making a comparison. And it's a very important phrase to be aware of so that you know that two or more things are being compared or looked at. And this again requires analysis. When we see firstly, secondly, thirdly, it tells us that the author is presenting ideas in a sequence. So that once you've seen firstly, you should be looking for the secondly or thirdly or next or words that indicate sequence. As a result, is one of our signal words or transition words that tells us that there are links being made between cause and effect. And to conclude, it's a summary of the preceding points. And these signal words are guide words to help us identify main ideas when we are engaged in text and trying to get information as we read. Critical reading. And this is the type of reading that at, at the academic level, especially, you're going to engage a lot in. The focus is on the author's intent, purpose, and how he conveys his ideas. It's the author's intent, purpose, and how he conveys those ideas. Attention is paid to the devices, strategies, and techniques. What we need to understand here is that these devices, strategies, and techniques would help guide you to understand the writer's purpose. We'll explore these concepts a bit more next week when we go into a lot more detail in our module one. But you need to know at this point that you need to know what are some of the devices, and we have some examples here, techniques and strategies like our figurative language, repetition, rhetorical questions, fact and opinion. Depending on what is used in the speech or writing, that tells you what the writer's intent or purpose is. And the third type of reading is one of my favorite, is reading for aesthetic purposes. It's aesthetic reading. This does not require any special skill other than basic reading skills. All you need to know is how to read in order to read for aesthetic purposes. This is an appreciation of the writer's style. It's an appreciation of the writer's use of humor. And it's reading because you have a personal interest in the topic. This is reading that helps to develop the reader's own style of writing through exposure to various strategies and vocabulary. This is a level of reading that if you engage in it at an early age, it helps form the basis for the kind of reader you develop into. Always make time for leisure reading. Always make time for leisure reading. Always make time for leisure reading. Even when you're preparing for your exams and you may have a lot of content to go over, take time to read for leisure purposes because it's going to enhance your comprehension skills. As we finish today, reading builds vocabulary. Vocabulary enhances understanding. We would not want to find ourselves in the position where a lack of vocabulary may make us seem smaller than we ought to be. When we have an example of an adult who's been told by a child, I have a limited vocabulary because I'm a child. What's your excuse? Let's not give ourselves excuses. We are in an academic and a learning environment and an opportunity to build, learn, and enhance our vocabulary. Let's take full advantage of it. So as we recap, our objectives today, and students would have been able to apply any of the different levels of comprehension to examples of spoken and written material. You were able to understand the purposes of active listening and apply them to selected situations and analyze the purposes for and types of reading. Next week, we are going to look at these areas and I want to let you know in advance so you can go and start to do some research, start to prepare so that you're able to move along with me. Next week we're going to look at 
main point, writer's purpose, organizational strategies, language techniques, and writer's tone. One of the things that I want you to also know is that a link will be set up so that you can go to an activity and an exercise that you should be able to get some feedback from in smaller groups. But I want you to practice. I want you to practice, so we're going to send you some information that you can work on based on the content that we covered today. So that's all for today, but I want to make sure that you reflect on everything that we covered, and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you.